Portland, Oregon has a reputation. This is a city that's seen as very liberal. So liberal, the sketch comedy show Portlandia has pumped out eight seasons of material based solely on mocking its progressiveness. But there's another side to Portland, one that upends its perception as some sort of liberal paradise. In the 1990s, this area was known as Skinhead City, and it was a part of a region from where neo-Nazis used to recruit for their so-called Northwest imperative. You said you almost stabbed a black guy out here once. Why? Because he was hitting on my girlfriend at the time, and it pissed me off, and so I pulled my knife out, I was getting ready to stab him, and I looked up, and there was a Portland PD about 10 feet away. The ubiquity of the internet and social media in the United States has only made the far-right recruitment process easier. Social media is big on the, the recruitment nowadays, especially uh, on YouTube. But what is it about the far right violence movement that lures people into it? I liked people being afraid of me. You know, it's very seductive when you feel powerless to even the illusion of power. Right wing extremism really is a direct challenge to liberal democracy. Hey fam, I'm Imayan, and for the third and final part of our series on far-right extreme violence, we've traveled to one of the most progressive cities in the nation, which also happens to be one of the whitest. And we're here to uncover why, even when Donald Trump leaves office, the problem of far-right violence won't end with his tenure, and how difficult it is to escape a life built on hate. There are nearly 650,000 residents in Portland, and more than 77% of them are white. That makes this place the whitest major city in the U.S., and perhaps the perfect breeding ground for people looking to enlist new white people in the far-right extremist movement. We come down here and look for uh, young kids, vulnerable kids, teenagers running around and that are white, obviously, and uh, try to introduce them to the neo-Nazi movement. A lot of times we give them like literature, uh, white power music. Jason Downard knows a lot about trying to woo white people to the extreme far right because he did it for years. And he says Oregon's history made his job of selling white supremacy much easier. How does such a liberal city have such an active white supremacist movement? It's a good question. It's formed, but Oregon, I think the biggest thing is Oregon was founded a white state, and back then, blacks were uh, banned from Oregon. He's right. Oregon was established as a white racist utopia. A former slave owner helped pass a law in 1844 expelling black people from the territory. This is 15 years before Oregon gained statehood. And when it finally does become a state, it puts that exclusion of black and non-white people into its constitution. And this made Oregon an incredibly fertile place for the Ku Klux Klan. In the 1920s, it had the largest Klan membership per capita among any state. So yes, Oregon has given all of its electoral votes to the last eight Democratic presidential candidates. But it is also a place with a long history of anti-blackness, which neo-Nazis have used as part of their recruitment process. So we're down here on the Portland waterfront and you used to recruit people for the neo-Nazi movement here. How did you do that? We come down here and look for uh, young kids, vulnerable kids, or uh, we recruit them and see if it's even worth a shot. Downard is a former neo-Nazi who first got involved with the movement during his 2009 prison sentence for a drive-by shooting involving the unlawful use of firearms. His body became a place to enshrine extremism, a way to literally display his hatred. Do you have any tattoos from your former life? No, they're all covered up, but 
you know, you can still see the WP for the white power underneath. Oh my God. You can see, yeah. And then these little black lines right here, this is the 1488. The 1488. Of all the things Downard and I discussed, what resonated with me most was just how covert far-right extremist tactics are. And it's by design. There was a, a conscious uh, shift away from sort of this like street thug life, gang-like culture. Dress nicer, get your education, and then infiltrate jobs like law enforcement, military, government policy, um, places where you could begin to enact some real change. Former neo-Nazi Shannon Foley Martinez says she wasn't recruited into violent, hate-fueled life by members who'd infiltrated her community. Instead, it was her insecurity as a self-proclaimed out-of-place teenager in search of an identity that started her on the path to extremism. Interestingly, like I started off uh, with like hippie 60s uh, anti-Vietnam uh, culture. Um, one of my very first favorite books was actually the autobiography of Malcolm X. Martinez says she was a person already susceptible to influence, and then a horrendous violation pushed her toward a life of hate. And I ended up being raped by two men at that party. Um, they were white men. Within about six months of uh, being sexually assaulted, I started hanging out with skinheads who were always on the periphery of the, the punk culture that I was a part of. Between the ages of 15 and 20, Martinez was a neo-Nazi and hoped it'd be a place she'd finally be able to belong. She thought being with the neo-Nazis could allow her to release the anger about her sexual assault. You know, my self-image and my self-worth just plummeted that, uh, you know, in the, in the wake of, of that rape, that I just felt like a piece of trash. I felt worthless on a, on a really deep and inherent level. And, you know, there's that part of me that was like, okay, well, like, who's worse than the Nazis? Like, they've got to take me in, right? Like, it doesn't matter that I'm, that I'm worthless. The community Martinez searched for and talks about is also a theme down at Echo. It's the sales pitch the hate group makes to potential members. It's all about this warped sense of unity. For Downard, the support was a group to belong to in a radically racialized prison system. His story is a tale of recidivism and getting deeply involved with the neo-Nazi movement with each subsequent conviction. Have there been violent crimes of which you haven't been associated with or convicted with when you were part of the movement? That's a trick question. No, no, it's not a trick question. Wait, have I committed? Yeah. I don't talk about those things. I mean, I've I've done I've done horrible things that like I got to live with every day. You know, almost stabbed some people and might have stabbed some. I, I won't go into those details. You know what I mean? Just because it's it's a hard thing to live with. Downard's and Martinez's neo-Nazi paths are one type of far-right extremism, which generally falls into two categories: political and anti-government like the alleged MAGA bomber Caesar Sayoc, a Republican and huge Trump supporter, accused of targeting the president's political enemies with mail bombs. And then there are those on the far right who are hate-based, like the neo-Nazis with whom Downard and Martinez were once affiliated. And though Downard says President Trump's rhetoric has played a role in reinvigorating far right groups, Donald Trump's presidency has been a victory for the movement. He's saying all the right stuff. So you get these neo-Nazis like, hey, we got this president. is pretty much giving us the okay to do whatever the hell we want. Author David Nywert says, even when Donald Trump leaves the Oval Office, this type of violent extremism will still be a problem. This problem didn't start with Donald Trump. When he leaves office, we're going to have another generation before we can really uh, sort of corral these forces of hatred that he's unleashed. What's happened is that a whole new generation of young people have been radicalized into this belief system. Nagward says President Trump's favorite cable news channel contributes to gassing up far-right extremism. 
We believe in free speech, even when it's reprehensible, maybe especially when it is. You'll see Tucker Carlson talking about white nationalism, on, or espousing white nationalist views on national TV, on Fox, and getting away with it. And people just kind of going, shrugging their shoulders. Nywood has followed the far right for 30 years, first as a journalist and later as an author. He says there's a reason far-right extremism movements are often unsuccessful. Typically, right-wing extremists never get enough momentum going because they've never uh, been able to stay cohesive for very long because of their very nature. So the, a lot of the people drawn to right-wing extremists are really kind of contentious and unpleasant people. They hardly ever get along. They're constantly fighting. What do neo-Nazis think of Klansmen and people like that? The neo-Nazis don't like the Klansmen. Uh, Why not? They're a bunch of drunk killbillies, like to me, and they're all, they're just weird. Like, I don't know. I've never liked them from the get-go. The birth of Downard's biracial nephew is one thing that helped spur him to reject his neo-Nazi beliefs. The other was a recovery facility he entered after another jail stint. So these are the doors you went into that changed your life? I was facing another year in jail. I was already in jail and was facing up to year, and so it's kind of my getaway. I had the chance to go to treatment. But leaving a life you've recruited people into is dangerous. It's, it's really hard um, because you're dealing with a uh, violent organization that's not only in your city, but it's, it's a worldwide, nationwide. They consider us race traitors and stuff like that, so. Do you worry about that? I did for a little bit, but I learned to get over it because I feel like what I'm doing is not only bringing peace to myself, but if I can tell my story, it can help somebody else that's maybe struggling like I was for a few years if I want to leave the movement or not. Downard now spends his time helping others escape a life of hate that consumed him until two years ago. He's hoping his transition from a self-proclaimed hooligan to patience, like his tattoo, will inspire others. I know there's people that is in the movement that wants to get out of the movement, but it's a very violent thing to get out, and some of them, they don't know how to. What I'm doing is not only bringing peace to myself, but it, if I can tell my story, it can help somebody else that's maybe struggling like I was for a few years. Like Downard, Martinez has dedicated her life to helping others escape the neo-Nazi lifestyle. And her approach is informed by how she felt when she left the movement. I, mean, I was very, very lonely. Um, you know, because who do you go to? Who do you say, you know, I'm really struggling because I was a Nazi. Like, how do you, how, who do you say that to? I remember exactly what I felt like during that time, how alone I felt, how confused I felt, how filled with shame that I felt. The mother of seven says even though she's been out of the movement more than a decade, the work she does on herself is never ending. A lot of people are going to see this video and wonder, can you ever really be a former white supremacist? Can you ever really be a former neo-Nazi? Until I started uh, sharing my story very publicly, uh, I, I had no idea that so many people believed that fundamental transformation is not possible. Now, I can categorically say I do not believe that ideology at all. I see how flawed and broken and just how harmful um, and have built a life on really trying to you know, make meaningful amends, um, do everything that I can, lending my voice to build a genuinely just and equitable uh, society for us to, to live in, that my transformation has indeed been an absolute one. In the process of creating this series, I talked to people around the nation. One thing I heard from a couple of interviewees was a call for empathy for those participating in far-right hate. They say we shouldn't shut them out because it could push them further into a life of hate. 
everyone is more than the worst thing that they've ever done. My question is, and was, what about their victims, like the people of color and bystanders that their hate targets? Why should they bear the burden of empathy or forgiveness? I absolutely understand that calls for any sort of empathetic listening or compassion towards white supremacists does not sit well with segments of the population. And I totally understand that. As a white person, it is my responsibility to dismantle white supremacy. As a person of color, it is not your responsibility to dismantle white supremacy. Hey fam, thanks so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. This is the third and final part of our series. If you've missed any of the previous episodes, please look them up. They're linked in the description, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time.